Okay, unfortunately, there's a big Zoom banner on top of my talk. That no, was online. Huh? Online, it's not. Okay, so I should just ignore it for just myself ignore. and allow the audience to do the same thing. <laughs> okay, um, so behind this weird banner, I want to talk about the mechanism of copper oxide high temperature superconductivity. Uh, so, this project is done now over the last, during the pandemic years, by a team in Oxford. Wenping Ren and Wei Rijin Chen, who will be here later in the week. A Cork, Chen Omani, our longtime collaborator, uh, Hiroshi Esaki in Scuba, Mohammed Hamidi in Cornell, and uh, Zhaolong Liu, who's now at Notre Dame. So, copper superconductivity. So, um, here everyone knows is the critical temperature below which materials go superconducting and become scientifically and technologically important because they are perfectly dissipationless, electrical and electronic materials. And, you know, for almost a hundred years, it was only a few tens of Kelvin. 1980s, it shot up into the 150 Kelvin range in the copper-based uh, materials. And again, in the early 2000s, it did the same thing in the iron-based materials. And over the last five years um, for hydrogen-based compounds, the critical temperature has reached room temperature. Now, psychologically, these results are extremely important. And also, if you're a betting person, they're very important because you can bet on who's going to win the Nobel Prize. Uh, but in terms of applications, they're not important because they only exist at you know, millions of atmospheres. The only place where this is uh, ambient pressure is um, at the center of the Earth, right? So they're really not very useful. The highest temperature ambient pressure superconductors are still the copper based superconductors, and this problem still remains unsolved. Finding out why do they superconduct at these extreme temperatures. Now, superconductivity is not economically important yet. It will be sometime in the 21st century to become very economically important. But scientifically, superconductivity is incredibly important. All of MRI, all of medical high field magnets, the vast majority of quantum sensing devices, um, photonic sensing devices, both for astrophysics and for quantum communication, um, transition edge bolometers for much of astrophysics, um, injection accelerators for high energy physics, high field magnets, the next generation LHC, there's going to be 120 kilometers of 16 Tesla magnets running through Switzerland and France. Amazing. Uh, high field magnets for research. Nowadays, there are many commercial companies using high temperature superconductivity to make compact tokamaks. This isn't much bigger than a Volkswagen to make compact tokamaks for fusion energy. And of course, the big kahuna is quantum information technology. There's a worldwide race in which superconductivity is by far the leading commercial technology um, to make quantum computers. Okay, so let's talk about copper superconductivity. I mean, what we want to know is why do these compounds superconduct at a good fraction of room temperature? And you know, if they're so close to room temperature, what little tweak could we do to the material science to get them up to room temperature? So in these compounds, um, you have a, a planar layer. The key layer is a single plane of copper, oxygen, copper, oxygen, copper, oxygen, copper, oxygen, often tetragonal, but sometimes orthorhombic. The copper atom is in the 3D9 state. So the 3D10 electron is missing. Um, so you could think of it as being occupied by one 3D9 electron, given the crystal field symmetry. That's probably the correct way to think about it. 
and so are all of them. And the oxygens are in the 2p6 state. They have captured electrons from elsewhere in the crystal and closed their p shells. Uh, now, the energy to doubly occupy to fill the 3d10 state of the copper atom is three electron volts. The Coulomb, the Hubbard energy, to put one more electron on this side is three electron volts. Um, so, but nevertheless, if you believed in uncorrelated physics of metals, you would deduce that this should be a metal because it's a half filled band, a half filled uh, D band. But it's not, it's an insulator. So here's how the electronic structure is arranged. There's a, this is the band which would come from the 3D9 states of all those coppers. This is the band which would come from the 2P6 states um, of all the oxygens. If you were to put one more electron into the coppers, you know, it would form a new state, which I'll show you in a second, which is often represented by an upper band. If you're really a band theorist, though, you know that this cartoon is not correct. Uh, because it's a heavily correlated system. The band structure depends on the configuration. Uh, but nevertheless, this is the cartoon that people usually use. The energy to doubly occupy this copper atom is said to be the Hubbard or Coulomb energy U between the two D states. And the key thing in the real physics of these compounds is that the energy to transfer, um, let's say, a hole from the upper band or an electron from the oxygen 2P6 band is this energy, we call that the charge transfer energy epsilon. In older books, that's called delta. But we were doing a study of superconductivity versus charge transfer energy. And if the charge transfer energy is called delta and the superconductivity is called delta, the referees were having a fit. So we, we gave this guy a new name. We call it epsilon. Okay. Now, when you want to hold up this compound to turn it from an insulator into a conductor, you remove an electron. That means you put a hole in. It's at this point that you have to acknowledge that the single band Hubbard model can never represent the physics of the cuprates because doping a hole into the cuprates puts the hole on the oxygen side. Then somehow this object hybridizes with its environment. There are various theories for how that happens. I don't know how it happens, but somehow it happens. And then this object becomes delocalized. And when it does, you get this amazing phase diagram. So temperature, um, this is the number of holes per unit cell. So over here, you have the charge transfer insulator. So, you know, this situation uh, was dubbed by Sawatsky before ITC was discovered as being a charge transfer insulator. So that's what I call it. So here you have a charge transfer insulator. You just put one or two percent of holes and the insulator disappears. That in itself is amazing. Then you put a few more percent of holes and a new state appears, which has gone unidentified now for almost, four, well, at least 35 years. It's called a pseudo gap phase, but I would call it electronic dark matter. It's a mysterious phase of many body quantum matter, which has gone unidentified. Then if you put like 15% of holes, you get high temperature superconductors, the strongest superconductors that we have today. And then if you put 30% of holes, you end up back with what appears to be a metal, a fairly straightforward. Okay. Now, how about what is the microscopic description of how this should happen? So let's look at two copper atoms. This is like a 1950s view of this problem, but so many people have forgotten the 1950s view of this problem that it's useful to think about it. So two coppers with an oxygen in between. So a transition metal oxide, actually a very common type of material. Um, there's a single electron on each copper site and the oxygen in between is closed. So here's my schematic of the charge transfer electronic structure. Here's the 3D9 state of this guy. Here's the 3D9 state of that guy. Here's the closed 2P6 shell of this guy. And these two things up here are ephemeral states, which will appear if you change the charge on the copper side. Now, at this level, you could write the Hamiltonian. People in the 50s were already writing down and solving this Hamiltonian for two spins. You could take the energy of the D atoms. You could take the energy of the P atoms. You could take the hopping rate from P to D and vice versa. 
and you could take the, the Hubbard energy on the site just for the dx. Right? Writing it down is doable. Solving it for two sites is doable. It's not easy, but it's doable. Solving it for a lattice is still a um, fundamental problem in physics unsolved. So let's think about what this represents just for two sites. So you can, I mean, you, you, <laughs> one might wonder why would it take 30 or 40 years to solve such an apparently simple problem? But there are deep reasons why. So consider the configuration of this guy, right? So here's one configuration, uh, spin down, spin down here, spin up here. And here's another configuration, spin up here, spin down. They're degenerate. Now, suppose one electron hops uh, from the 2p state into the, the, D, the D manifold. But now a very strange thing happens. This lower state disappears. It no longer exists. The energy required to have these two electrons in the copper side is here. So the eigenstates of the system depend on where the electrons are. And there are four ways that this can happen. And then you can go down into further, for example, if you allow two hops, you, get, you end up in situations like this and so on. Even the manifold of two spin a half correlated problem is large. It's solvable, but it's large. Now, if you reduce this problem just into the sub Hilbert subspace of the spin <coughs> degrees of freedom, forget the Coulomb interactions. I mean, you have to, you have to keep all these states available in your Hilbert space, but just consider the ones which have to do with magnetic interaction between the two spins. At the end of the day, already people knew in the mid 1950s that the Hamiltonian linking these two spins is the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. This J here is called the super exchange energy. Charge transfer super exchange is what we're dealing with here. And if you solve this problem, okay, so some of you will have been the single band covered model is the correct way to look at this problem, but I don't believe that's true. I think you have to consider the real solution, including the 2p6 state. If you solve that problem, which is something chemistry graduate students usually have to do, but physicists no longer have to do, um, you get this for j. j goes as 4, the hopping rate to the power of 4, divided by charge transfer energy plus the uh, oxygen on-site energy squared, plus 1 over the Hubbard energy plus this term. Now, up is the energy to doubly occupy the oxygen. Let's set that to 0. So that will simplify things. And then now let's make ud much bigger than epsilon. So the splitting between the two D states is much bigger than the splitting between the oxygen P state and the upper D state. In that limit, you get this for the strength of the super exchange energy. If you have a strong hopping rate and a modest <laughs> charge transfer energy, you can end up with an exchange uh, interaction J here, which is in the range of hundreds of Kelvin. Okay. Now let's consider that um, Hamilton, let, let's just consider the spin degree of freedom of that Hamiltonian. Assume that the no double occupancy constraint on the copper atoms prevents all transport. And now try to solve for a lattice, okay, a square lattice. Okay, so you could guess, you probably have done this as a homework problem. If you do it in two sub lattice vice mean field theory, it's pretty easy to do, but you can solve it properly as well using modern techniques and you'll find out that it's a square lattice spin a half antiferromagnet each site the spin is opposite to the other side on the other hand the electronic structure of this object is what you would have expected there's a lower hover band there's an upper hover band there's an oxygen band in between and the separation between here and there is the charge transfer the oxygen copper charge transfer so if super exchange is the dominant interaction between the spins, and if for a square lattice, it should produce an antiferromagnet, what does it do in the cube rates? Well, uh, one of the members of the audience showed very beautifully that the, the spin excitation spectrum of CuO2 is almost precisely what you would expect for a square lattice spin a half antiferromagnet. So putting aside the beauty of the experiment, strategically what that means is definitely the super exchange is the dominant spin mechanism in the parent state of these contracts. All right, now instead of having four electrons in this manifold, let's take away one. 
Now we have three electrons. It doesn't look like a massive change, but it's a completely different phase diagram when you do that. Uh, the pseudo gap phase appears and the high temperature superconductivity appears. Now, you know, taking away that electron, you may, you may produce a few more um, quantum mechanical states here near the top of the p-band. In my opinion, that's not a solved problem. I mean, there are people who believe they have solved it, but in general, in my opinion, that's not a solved problem. So some more states may appear here by introducing the holes, but they don't dominate the band structure. You're still going to be left with the original band structure. Under those circumstances, okay, a somewhat a, wor a work of intuitive genius by Phil Anderson was to say that the uh, antiferromagnetic super exchange survives the whole doping, but instead of making an antiferromagnet, it makes singlet pairs, d symmetry. We now know d symmetry spin zero singlet pairs. That was Phil's conjecture in 1986. In my opinion, it's true. Uh, but one needs to pursue evidence of that. Now, one thing Phil, God rest his soul, probably wouldn't agree with is that it has to do with charge transfer. He very much liked the idea of a single band Hubbard model where the Coulomb, onside Coulomb energy is the real control problem. Uh, nevertheless, this is CuO2. So without doubt, <laughs> the key energy in the system is the charge transfer energy. So I have morphed his ingenious proposal slightly here by saying a charge transfer energy produces the pairing and then when a many body state appears where this average uh, and these are different these are adjacent sites when this average is not zero then you have high temperature super okay now of course i didn't make that up already uh, so here's phil's ingenious proposal already in the same year vic emery had proposed that you had to use the three band covered model. Not the one band covered model, but take all the two P6 states into account. Um, and then, you know, many, many of, of the world's leading correlated electron theorists over the subsequent years studying that problem uh, developed growing agreement that um, super exchange pairing could plausibly be the mechanism of copper based superconductivity. So that's nice. All right. But here we are 35 years later. If you read papers published, let's say in the last 12 months, they're on the same subject. Pairing blue in the two dimensional Hubbard model. Pairing in the two dimensional Hubbard model. Pairing correlations in the cuprates. A numerical study of the three band Hubbard, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, why would it be that 35 years later people are still cranking on the same? Well, the answer is it's unresolved. There's great, there's no unanimity among a certain class of theorists that they're sure they know the solution. But Unanimity among there's unanimity among string theorists as well, and that doesn't always prove to be productive for our understanding of the world, right? You actually need experimental evidence in order to be sure that you have the correct view of what's going on. What's unresolved is experimental. Okay, now let's turn our attention to that. Now, for that, we need to look at the three band Emory model a bit more carefully. Here's the Gemini, passed away as a relatively young man, most unfortunately. But he had a very clear idea of correlating electrons. So already in 87, his Hamiltonian took the D or the 3D9, 3D10, 3D10 orbitals of the D atom, the 2P6 orbitals of the P atoms in the plane. Okay took all of them, took the hopping rates between copper and oxygen, which is TPD, and also he even took the hopping rates between oxygen and oxygen, TPP. And he kept the on-site Coulomb interaction, which is known from X-ray studies to be there. So that's an interesting Hamiltonian. And if you extend this Hamiltonian to the whole crystal, it wasn't solvable then, and it's not solvable now. It's very, very complicated correlated electron Hamilton. So the modern way to attack this problem is 
dynamical mean field. One of the modern ways to attack this problem is dynamical mean field. So I'm not a theorist, but I should just give you a thumbnail sketch of what's the machinery behind what's going on. So in dynamical, suppose you want to study CO2 in dynamical mean field theory. So you take a little cluster, let's say one copper and maybe, maybe two oxygens, that might be the minimum. Or in fact, sometimes, yeah, sometimes people will have studied the single band model, they just take one copper atom. But if you want to study the Emory Hamiltonian, you could take one copper and two oxygens with some spectrum of excited states like this. Um, so you take the accurate Hamiltonian to the best of your knowledge, this guy parameterized for the real material. You take this Hamiltonian and now you embed it in a medium, a metallic state described by its means functions. And then you solve, you know, what is the, what are the impurity uh, eigenstates of this system when it's embedded in this hypothetical metal. And the solution will be a set of Green's functions uh, for this impurity. And you take those Green's functions, you update the self energy, okay? Um, and then you um, describe the, this CO2 system plus the medium by a new Green's function. And then you check, is the new Green's function consistent for the medium? Consistent with the Green's function you originally proposed. And of course it isn't on the first iteration. So now you update the Green's function for the medium and go again. And you go around and around, you go around billions of times sometimes, improving the Green's function for the medium so that the solution for the Green's function of the impurity state becomes consistent with the Green's function for the medium. And it's in that sense, it's called dynamical mean field theory. Eventually, if it converges, you reach a state where your impurity state Green's function is the same as your medium Green's function. And then you're said to have found uh, a, D, a cluster DMFT solution for this problem. Okay. So, as computing power has increased, the number of orbitals you can do, for which you can do this, has increased. So, in the last two or three years, people have been able to take four coppers and eight oxygens. Okay. Um, that's 12, but there's two orbitals each. There's 24 orbitals in some of those solutions. Embedded in a material, material with hypothetical Green's functions of the same symmetry, go around in this loop, solving. Now they typically solve by continuous time quantum Monte Carlo, the impurity state. Update the, find the cluster self energy, update the Green's function, go around until it converts. If it converges, now you know your Green's functions for the whole system. At that point, you can make the following calculation. The average of this function over your sample, the anomalous average representing the superconductivity, is that number zero or is it finite? If that number is finite, A, they call it the order parameter, and B, they say the system is superconductive. So that's the cluster DMFT machinery. And now you could say, okay, well, okay, if it's superconducting, what is the, tell me what is the mechanism? I didn't see the hypothesis for what is the mechanism going into this story, but it is there. The hypothesis for the mechanism just has to do with the hopping uh, rates having to do with the charge transfer energy, which is allowing hopping of holes on and off of the oxygen sites. That's it. And in modern versions of this theory, as they adjust the charge transfer rate, it controls the strength of the superconductivity. So you could parameterize this as super exchange energy by this charge transfer rate, but you know, the super exchange doesn't appear explicitly in the Hamiltonian. What appears in the Hamiltonian is the difference um, in energy between the P orbital and the D orbital, that number. So charge transfer super exchange is the mechanism in this calculation. Yeah. Just, to, Jeff, just to get some questions going. Of course, for charge transfer to work, you've implicitly made U infinite or very, very big. Yeah. So it's it to, to say it's not there or imply it's just charge transfer is to ignore the elephant that you've made if, infinite. If we examine the CDMF, you're perfectly correct, but if we examine the CDMFT solutions and take them at face value, 
and you know the world leading CDMFT solutions are from uh, Hull and Cochlear, <laughs> so we do pay for them this value. Um, you don't have to increase the charge transfer energy very much before you kill the superconductivity, and the amount by which you have to increase it is tiny compared to the right. on site. But it's it's charge transfer within a within a manifold of six that doesn't allow double occupancy. That's correct. Of the yeah, that's so that, correct. If you did allow double occupancy of these, you'd always. Oh yes, that's that. correct. Sorry, that's correct. Yeah. Yes. That's so correct. Yes. Yeah. So obviously, the MFT has its error box, and as I understand, the biggest problem is. But there are too many instabilities which are caused by the, from stripes to V density waves to superconductivity and the battle within the nerves is small is error problem. So why should like do you believe that the MFT has enough predictive power to, to see so, the subtle so, differences? Yeah, so strategically that's a ser very serious question, which remains to be answered. But at the end of the talk, I can propose a way that we could attack that problem and answer it. You know, just on the basis of theory, I don't think you can answer it because you always have a situation where one colleague would say, well, my DMFT code is perfect and yours is crappy. But of course, they would swap places <laughs> in that argument. So if one could find the link between predictive degrees of freedom of DMFT and real experiments, then you could close the loop using the traditional tools of physics research. You're saying that there will be some parameters which you can add to the MFT, which you can calibrate. Yeah, so that, that, that's what we're here. That, that's why I got interested. I mean, I've always been interested in the MFT, but finally we found a place where there are two knobs they can turn and they're related to two things we can measure. So that's how we got to this one. Okay. This is a recent paper from um, Andre Marie Tremblay's group in Sherbrooke. And it's very important for us because it uses the correct parameters for the BISCO compound, which is the one we can study. It uses physically valid parameters for BISCO. But for example, and this is their density of states, total and resolved by the two bands. And it's a three band emery model. And it's got four oxygens and eight, uh, sorry, four coppers and eight oxygens. You can see there's a lower hover band here. This is their label, and there's a lower hover band. There's a charge transfer band, there's an upper hover band, and there's a band which is produced by doping into the compound. And they can detect this gap between the top of the hybridized oxygen P band and the empty D band and label it as the charge transfer. Band. So in their theory, they can measure that number. Of course, in their theory, they can measure that function as well. So that's the utility for experimentalists. Okay. All right. So um, yeah, so this is a span over the years of growing confidence that this charge transfer super exchange or just the three band correlated memory model is the mechanism of cuprate superconductivity. It's actually rather widely believed by many of the world's leading numerical theorists involved in solving that problem. Okay, but where does the contact come with experimentalists? So this is a beautiful paper by Hall and Cochlear, a decade ago, in which they first showed using um, DMFT that you could quantify what happens to CI, CJ, expectation value versus the charge transfer energy, keeping the other parameters of the material constant and making them as accurate as possible. Mm -hmm. And they showed that if you increase the charge transfer energy, you drive down the, you can think of this, I think of this as the amplitude of the many body pair wave function. Uh, although they often use the word order parameter, that's a bit confusing to me. To me, this is the amplitude of the pair wave function. You can drive that down and zero temperature by turning up the charge transfer energy by a factor of two. So you assume it's a dual superconductor. You do not consider any other states. You say, if it is a dual superconductor, that's what they get. Um, I'm not competent to decide whether or not when one of these colleagues says, I find the superconductivity to be the solution of my of the problem. It's the loophole, because let's say, if you're just making one state, the MFT, you're not including 
something something that was allowed to move. It's very true, but if you read these papers, they're confident that they are detecting the amplitude of the carrier wave function in their solution. Okay. Could get something like a spectrum spin with S, but I think it doesn't. It's not stable in this for this parameter. If for the ions, something like spin with S would be a good. Um, surface shape is different. So obviously there are competitions and disagreements between yeah. people who do those numerical experiments, um, but they are somewhat, they are absent experimental val validation of what's going on. It's not clear who you should believe, it's not clear to me who you should believe, okay? So you need experiments. All right. So just maybe just yeah. the same sort of optimization type of question. Does the calculation bound that when you change the charge transfer energy and one finds uh, the optimal dosing that uh, gives the maximal carrying yeah. opportunity. Yes, it, it, it does. It doesn't give the maximum TC for interesting reasons. The TC isn't directly related to the carrying amplitude. Some kind of noise temperature carrying amplitude. It gives the maximum carrying amplitude. There are several papers of course. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a, this is for why yttrium barium copper oxide, there's a detailed study of that compound showing that it does maximize the pair amplitude with increasing all the keeping the other parameters the same. I was just wondering what it but, but, No, but typically they don't vary, the, you know, the, for the charge transfer energy to vary by two volts, you're in a different material. They don't vary that parameter when they're trying to figure out what's happening to the phase diagram. They just vary the carrier density. And they fix this parameter at a certain value representing the material. Actually, that's what this dot is. The real parameter for the real material, that's what this dot is, the real parameter for, for the real material. So this was kind of a thought experiment by Hall, Weber, Hall, and Katia, and this is a equivalent thought experiment by Tromblay's group. So you set the parameters so that you get high TC superconductivity in visco, mm -hmm. and now keeping the carrier density the same, you change the charge transfer energy and see what happens. And they predict the trajectory upon which the pair amplitude evolves with the charge transfer. Well, maybe it's a reasonable assumption that the primary effect of changing the charge transfer energy that is to change J and that will not affect the yeah. doping at which you know, yeah. So, yeah, so one one could make that assumption, but when you're actually solving this Hamiltonian, you don't use J, you use epsilon. You could calculate J, but they don't. Okay. Now, now to clamp onto this from the experimental point of view. So this is some number. It doesn't appear to have any context, but we decided to normalize it by the ambient parameters of the compound. So we divide this axis by that number, and that tells us the rate of change of uh, pair wave function amplitude with charge transfer energy predicted by this theory. Does that make sense? So just to make sure it's not because I so, so this out. number is somewhat arbitrary, right? It's just a relative number in the calculator. But that's not my question because it was a pair of amplitude to remember is it was a particle pair. Why couldn't it be CS? Well they're only reporting the pair what they report is CI C D H average. But in experiments well, let's come back to experiment in a second. So so, so we took these theories and said that they predict for Visco that the rate of change of the amplitude is this number. And actually for uh, LSCO, it's this number, published. This one was normalized by that point, which is said to be the, um, the, norm, the standard parameters of the crystal. And this one was normalized by that point, which is said to be the standard parameters of that crystal. And there's a beautiful, uh, in, the, in the supplementary material of this paper, which is hard to find, but does exist. There's a big table where Hall and Katia identify all the material parameters that are used in these models to do these calculations. So, you, 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 and, and most of the people in this field use that table when they're doing their own calculations. So they're not comparing dogs with cats. At least they're just at least they're comparing dogs with dogs when they do the calculations. Okay. Now, now we're getting close to what an experimentalist could do, but there is a problem here. CI dagger CJ is a complex field. And unfortunately, 
due to their moral and ethical feelings, experimentalists cannot measure complex numbers. In our universe, we can only measure real numbers. So we have to convert this prediction into real numbers. And we just do that by saying that the number of uh, convex pairs is the wave function amplitude squared. Um, in an uncorrelated superconductor, first of all, this is theoretically true. And secondly, we've done experiments to show that it is experimentally true. But here we're making this assumption, we convert this number into this rate. The rate of change of condensed pairs with the charge transfer energy for BISCO should be minus 0.93 per volt. According to the three band cluster DMFT model of that compound. All right. If let's say size and j changes linearly with epsilon, then size and j squared should change quadratically with epsilon. It, it, well, we're, we're dealing so, with small changes, and that's our assumption. So you, that it's then it, it matters around which point the linear. Yeah, that's true. I agree. This is the best we could do. They didn't predict the number for us, so we have but to. You, but you know at which point you give us the real. Yeah. All right. So now let's convert this to something that one could hang one sack on. So here is some normalized density of condensed pairs in a car in a, in a copper superconductor. And here's the charge transfer energy in the same superconductor. So here is the original Weber, Howell, and Cotillard prediction for what would happen in lanthanum cuprate. And here is the more recent prediction for what would happen in Visco. So why and is it a straight line? We should discuss it should be a say again? Why is it a straight line? It should be a parabola. It, it's, we're, assume, we're just taking the- Oh, because the range is small. The range is small. We just take the, in fact, it is a parabola. You're quite correct, but we just take a small range. And it happens that most of the other cuprates are in this cone of interest. If you were an astrophysicist, you would say the action should be within this cone of interest if you have a positive. Okay. Well, but how could you possibly make a test of this model? Admittedly, it's a very simple model, but it's a useful model for the experiments. Um, so, there you have copper, copper and oxygen. You have this description of the electronic structure, copper, copper and oxygen, the upper D band. Okay. Now above each oxygen atom, there's another, uh, sorry, above each copper atom, there's another oxygen. It's an oxygen ion, it's doubly ionized, it's negatively charged in the cube. So, um, Okay, so uh, what Weber, Hall, and Cotillard did was to consider not if I change the charge transfer energy in the plane, what happens, but what happens if I move this ion up and down. Now the horizontal axis is the distance of the apical oxygen atom from the copper atom in the plane. If I move the apical atom up and down, what does it do to the charge transfer energy within this three band hover? It's not crazy. If you move the apical ion farther away, then you're diminishing the Coulomb energy on site for both oxygen and copper. So you diminish the charge transfer. And now a number of groups, quite a lot of groups actually have been doing these calculations because from the experimentalist point of view, you know, moving around the apical oxygen atom is at least conceivable. You could, there are various ways you could think of doing it. Originally, what Gabby proposed is that you would substitute the apical oxygen atom uh, by a sulfur atom. And the sulfur atom um, having less negative charge at the site where he posed its equilibrium would alter the charge transfer energy and therefore drive up TC. But 
It turned out those compounds couldn't be synthesized. So we're back to the oxygen now. Uh, within the cluster DMFT scheme of the three band emery model, if you move the oxygen, the apical oxygen atom away, you reduce the charge transfer energy. There is widespread spread agreement on that statement. And roughly the amount by which it goes down is about an electron volt per angstrom. If you think about it, that's not crazy. You have a doubly ionized oxygen atom, you know, three and a half or four angstroms away. You move it away by another angstrom, how much would it change the electrostatic potential? Electron volt is not crazy. So how much could you change by the C axis compression? It could be, yes. So Originally. So it could be changed by quite a lot. But the main problem is the fossil ratio of these materials is such that if you compress it on one axis, you change the parameters on the other axis. But absolutely. So 25 years ago, a lot of people were trying to do exactly that, to manipulate the location of the apical atom to control the high system. All right. All right. So now let's take experimentalist view of this situation. The distance from the copper to the apical, that's called that delta. So here's a schematic of the plane. Co uh, oxygen, copper, oxygen, copper, oxygen, copper. Here's a schematic of the apical oxygen, here's delta. So here's a schematic of the energy structure of the plane in the presence of the apical. Um, then from the three band DMFT model, one could predict what should be the amplitude of the pair field. We can't measure that, but we can measure the number density of pairs. So the concept we started with is we want to move the apical oxygen atom. We want to find out what does it do to the electronic structure here, specifically what does it do to the charge transfer energy as it moves around? And then what does that do to the superconductivity? So Wang Ping Ren made this nice movie to schematize his ideas. You want to move around. So if you move down, the charge transfer energy goes up. If you move up, the charge transfer energy goes down. When the charge transfer energy goes up, the superfluid goes down. When the charge transfer energy goes down, the superfluid goes up. All in the linear approximation of small changes. Even the sign of this is interesting, right? But the proposal is that um, as you move the apical oxygen away, you get more superconductivity, which is something that material science people have believed for a long time in these compounds. Okay. All right, so now we need to visualize the apical distance, the charge transfer energy, and the density of electron pairs. All right, so here mother nature comes to the rescue. The BISCO compound, um, has a bulk static modulation in the dimensions of the unit cell. This has been known for 30 years or more. It's a well-known property of this compound. Every nine units, so the, this is the one, this is the CO2 axis, and this is the CO2 axis. At, at 45 degrees, every nine unit cells, the uh, top surface of the crystal, this is the bismuth oxide there, modulates from a high elevation uh, down to a low elevation here and back to a high elevation. So high, low, high, low, high, low, et cetera, et cetera. Every 26 point something angstroms in this unit, in this material, the apical distance is changing. That's a fact. So now you have to figure out by how much could it be changed? There are refi X-ray refinements of the positions of all the atoms in the unit cell in this compound. Now, this is a complicated compound, so I wouldn't bet my house on the refinement of their locations, but different research groups agree on the refinement, so they're not crazy people. So what they tell us is that when the bismuth atom is at its maximum displacement, the distance between the apical atom and the copper atom is at a minimum. And when the bismuth atom is at its minimum displacement, the distance between the copper and the apical oxygen is at a maximum. And that's because the amplitude of, of corrugation in the top surface is smaller than the amplitude of corrugation in the, in the plane. There's no one who disagrees about that. Um, 
So from the refinement, you know, when the bismuth atom is at maximum vertical displacement, the uh, distance um, between the apical, let's call it the apical to copper distance is 2.2 angstroms, 2.25. And when the bismuth atom is at its minimum displacement, then the apical distance to copper is 2.5. So the key atom is moving around in the unit cell by 0.3 angstroms in a unit cell of size less than four angstroms. So if you know something about material science, those are massive distance changes for the location of the atom in the unit cell, 10% of the unit cell. And this is almost an incident. It isn't a metal. So the Thomas Fermi screening length of a fraction of an angstrom doesn't exist here. The Coulomb interaction of that apical motion is felt throughout the crystal. All right. Now in the STM, we have enough precision where we can see this is the line of maximum. That's the zero phase of this supermodulation it's called. This is pi halfway through the cycle. This is two. And you know, in a field of view like this, we know where every copper is, we know where every, every oxygen is, we have enough geometrical information to tell us where every object is in this field at the atomic scale. So by imaging this uh, surface distortion, our working hypothesis, our working machinery is that by imaging the surface distortion, we can determine what's the integral distance as a function of location throughout the units. So that's the first thing. Could you, you know, estimate how big is, is the apical atom moving definitely? How far is it moving? 0.3 of an angstrom. Can you measure how far it is in a given unit cell? Roughly, yes. All right, next thing is the energy gap. Okay. In single electron tunneling spectroscopy, you can see the energy separation between a high density of state span below the chemical potential and a high density of state span above the chemical potential. Actually, all STM people have known that for 20 or 30 years. It's not a big surprise. Um, Yan Yu Wang showed a few years ago this uh, very nice paper that you know one can essentially measure the energy gap between the top of the lower band and the bottom of the upper band as a function of location, which is a great idea. Now you can quibble about, you know, is this really the charge transfer energy in the three band Hamiltonian? Right? At present, I don't know, right? You would need more detailed predictions of the integrated density of states as a function of energy to be sure. But it certainly is the energy gap between the top of the lower band and the bottom of the empty band. That's a fact that you can just see from the term. So in our study, that's the distance we're measuring. The energy from the top of the lower band um, to to the bottom of the upper band. And this is a logarithmic scale of the density of states. So, the, you know, the density of states takes off like a rocket. It's reasonably well defined how big that displacement is. Now you can say, did you quantitatively measure the charge transfer energy accurately? I don't know. You can say, can we quantify variations from one location to the other in what we're measuring accurately? The answer is yes, we can. So we're going to measure this energy distance between the two bands, and I'm going to refer to it as the charge transfer energy from now. Last thing we need to measure, look at our list. We also need to measure the density of electron pairs. So for that, we use the Josephson effect. Here's a superconducting sample, and here is a superconducting tip. If they are within and if the junction resistance between them is low enough, and if there's any so junction researchers in the audience, they know that that number has to be tens of kilo ohms or something. It can't be gig ohms. It's very, very difficult at high junction resistance. But if this junction resistance is low enough, then the pair wave functions overlap. There's a Josephson current density, which has to do with the geometry of the junction the energy barrier, the work function, the cross-sectional area, multiplied by what is usually called the product of the two order parameters in um, and the Gaukar-Baratov theorem. But actually, 
that's actually the square root of the density of the condensed pairs. That's the way I'd like you to think about it. In a BCS, that would be good. Expectation value squared of CI dagger CJ is the number density. So now we can integrate over this junction, Amber Dark and Baratov, you find out the critical current, the Josephson critical current by the junction resistance is proportional to the uh, order parameter in the sample, the order parameter in the tip. The order parameter in the tip is a constant. We make sure of that. So now if we square this side, it should be proportional to the number density of condensed pairs in the sample at that location. That's the working idea. Measure the Josephson critical current squared as a function of location. Keep the junction resistance constant. You get a picture of the density of condensed pairs. This, this can't work. Yeah. And the tip is an S wave supercomputer or So there's a very nice, there are two very nice papers by Dirk Moore where he analyzes first the S wave case and second the D wave case to show that this is true. Some call like S wave is D wave does not give you destructive. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry. Here I meant the same symmetry on both sides. So it's always the same. It, yes, the assumption, assumption in this simple presentation is the same on both sides. Yeah. It's an open question about how to deal with an S wave tip on a complicated superconductor. That is not a solved problem. But actually, do you see anything when it's an S wave tip on the D wave? Well, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect tetragonal crystal. Sure. That means the point group symmetry of the Cooper pair is not perfect. That means there's always some overlap with the wave function. But in detail, that's not a solved problem. Like in YBCO, it's so orthorhombic that we would guess there has to be a big S wave component. All right, this can never work for the following reason. If you take a conventional, this is the Ambergaukar Baratov equation. If you take a conventional energy gap here, let's say a millimeter, okay? And if you take a typical SCM junction resistance, let's say a jiggle, then you will find out that the Josephson energy is a few nano electron volts, or the Josephson characteristic temperature of the junction is a few 10 microcalculus. You, you can't stabilize the phase difference of a single atom Josephson junction with the junction resistance of a giga ohm the way you do it in STM. No one has ever succeeded to do that. So instead, uh, this is what's done. This was introduced um, by Bob Dutt. If you consider a um, um, junction shunt capacitance model, but now the phase is not stable. It's KT is larger than the Josephson energy so that the phase is moving around on the potential as a function of phase difference of the junction. Um, then uh, suppose this is the distribution of quantum phase differences. If the integral of sine theta over the distribution of theta is not zero, then there are pairs going through the junction, even though there's a voltage due to the drifting of the phase. So that problem was solved by I and Z in 1969. I love this paper. It's a beautiful, elegant paper. In the limit where the capacitance goes to zero, you can solve this equation as a Langevin equation, very nice solution. And they show that the pair current at finite voltage has this form. Okay, this form. And the maximum in the pair current at finite voltage is proportional to the Josephson critical current squared. Um, or if you want to measure pair conductance, di pair dv, there's a peak in the pair conductance, the peak in the pair conductance at zero bias, which has nothing to do with any Meyer levels, <laughs> just the Josephson effect. The peak in the conductance is proportional to the maximum, which is proportional to the Josephson critical current squared. So even though you can't fix the phase across this Josephson junction, you can still measure what's the critical current squared by measuring what's the maximum in the pair current. That's the working hypothesis. So now we would like to measure, image the electron pair condensed electron pair density by measuring the maximum in the pair current at finite voltage and keep the normal junction fixed or deal with it by experiment. Okay. All right. So for a long time, that was not a doable project. Dines had introduced these ideas at 4 Kelvin, even at junction resistances of, say, 50 kilo ohms. 
he couldn't make an image because although he could detect the, he could detect this signal at 50 kilo ohms the tip is already poking into the surface <laughs> so he couldn't move it around and make an image the trick we have to deal with is to drive up the junction resistance so we can make an image while maintaining the Josephson critical current as high as possible and keeping the temperature as low as possible. So we did that by building up a millikelvin STM and making the STM tip, so it's about 50 millikelvin is the operating temperature, making the STM tip a high TC tip by exfoliating a tiny little piece of bisco onto the tip. And we can tell that this has succeeded because on the one hand, we can measure the single particle spectrum and now the separation between the peaks is, you know, 100 millivolts, which is four delta, not two delta. So two delta from the tip and two delta from the sample. And these are different tips. We have a recipe for this. And our colleagues in Brookhaven have a recipe for this, which works in Brookhaven as well. So this is, although this is black, although this is, okay. Although this is magic, it isn't black magic. That's uh, uh, furthermore, using this scheme, we can retain the atomic resolution. So now we have a high a D wave, high gap, high TC tip with atomic resolution at millikelvin temperatures. Under those circumstances, I wouldn't be telling you about this if you push the junction resistance in steadily into the range of mega ohms, then you see the Josephson branch appear. And you see here, these are only microvolts. This is, there's no quasiparticles moving, going through the junction here. It's only pairs, because we're only applying microvolts, even though we're getting a big curve. So now what we're supposed to measure is the maximum in that curve as a function of locus. So in this field of view, this was Mohammed Hamidian's great work. So in this field of view, yeah. So what is what do you think about Iran? Should it be that this was a particles? Well, in Ambergal Karbaratov, you should drive down on it in order to drive up the current. All right, but this this model, right? That was resistant in Shanti Junction. So uh, what is the Okay, good. So shunting. so the range of RNs we were using here are between two and ten mega ohms, and this model is perfectly valid. It, it's just like resistant somewhere else in the circuit. I should not think about it as arising. Physically, what is R in? Now I understand. Okay, so the current uh, voltage characteristic is, you know, maybe like this, depending on the shunt resistance. So R in is just the slope of this line as V is much greater than V delta. Well, I guess my question is: I should think one over the slope of that resistor is in series or in parallel to the junction? In the model, it's in parallel. It's in parallel, right? But so, so effectively, that, it's in parallel here as well because it's just the resistance of the of the gap between the tip and the surface. It's not a it's not a device elsewhere in the circuit. Well, but usually, it would be like some quasi particle current, right? Because for you, it's I mean, this tunneling is just part of your Google pair tunnel, right? And you have a resistor somewhere. F fine, fine, the fine. But look, series. okay. Let's look at the numbers, okay? So for cube rates, this would be, let's say, 100 millivolts in order to measure what that resistance is, right? Okay. Now, to get the Josephson current, you would be down here at 20 microvolts, okay? So there are no quasiparticles going through the junction at those tiny bytes. Oh, right. That's exactly why I'm sort of trying to understand how I should think about this normal resistor, because naively, there is nothing in parallel so I I can easily see resistors but, but in this, series. But this is the IV characteristic of that device. It's... But you map it to oh, yeah, the Manchin Kazilgerman, which a has a in parallel. Absolutely. This, I mean, this isn't an easy experiment. You need a dynamic range of 10 to the 5 so that you can measure this piece at 100 millivolts and this piece at 10 microvolts in the same experiment. Yeah. Okay, there is no other element in the circuit. The current voltage characteristic does look like that. And we use that fact to determine the RN parameter of the ember uh, The question about charging energy is you know, yeah. as you well, you made it too large, you lose your chosen tightening. Now, how is that balance working? Uh, yeah, the charging energy was a problem for us, Pierce. You're quite correct. If the systems start to become nonlinear here, mm -hmm. when the capacitance uh, 
got into the wrong range. So and how did you solve that? Did you make it a bigger tip or what was the game you played? I just ordered my colleagues to solve it. <laughs> they found that there's a range of parameters for the junction resistance between two and 10 megaohms where the current voltage characteristic uh, was consistent with the IZ model and we used it on that basis. But we didn't solve it in an engineering sense, we solved it in a practical sense. And we have done a whole round of experiments of niobium on niobium diselenide to test our understanding of this problem. And we run into the same situation. In niobium on niobium diselenide, if the junction resistance is, say, five megaohms, everything works fine. If you go down below one megaohm, you start to see both Josephson and Andreev. And if you go down even lower, you get a very complicated combination of pair tunneling, Andreev bound states, and quasi particle tunneling. So you have to go into the correct parameter range for this to work. And do you believe that you're able to focus your jokes and current on a single atom or one or two atoms or how large an area is it going to? So if you come to the talk on Friday, I will answer that question. I'll certainly be Can you wait? <laughs> but can you give us a quick answer? Yes. We have a paper in science showing that you can see atomic resolution. So you think it's really going through individual Well, well okay, right. so, so if you're asking me, do the two electrons of what a human being perceives as a Cooper <laughs> pair of size 1,000 angstroms go through one atom? Of course they don't, right? But the condensate isn't a bucket of Cooper pairs. It's a many-body waveform, right? right? So there is a correlated pair tunneling through one. And Michel Estev had shown that long ago in great junctions. All right, so now we're going to measure this, you know, maximum in the, in the pair current at very at microvolts in this field of view with a tip that we know to be D wave superconductive tip from the single particle spectrum as a function of location. It looks like this. This was one of the first images ever made of the condensate, probably the first image ever made of the condensate in a cuprate superconductor. And it looks pretty hairy, actually. There's a lot of action in there. A lot of strange and unexpected things happen. Okay. Okay. So one of the referees for that paper, to whom we are very grateful, said, Okay, suppose you make a new microscope, suppose you make a new telescope, right? You point it at the sky, you take a picture, and you say, Well, I took a picture of the neutrino background radiation. But can you prove that what you said it's taking a picture is taking a picture of is really what it took a picture of? Can you prove that this is a picture of the condensate? So there's a way to do that in principle. It had been known for many years that if you put a zinc atom on the copper side, you cut off the charge transfer fluctuations because the zinc atom D shell is closed. <laughs> so there's no superconductivity at those sites. And you can tell from new one spin rotation experiments that there's a little nanometer scale droplet surrounding every zinc atom where there's no compass in the cuprates. Uh, isaki -san had zinc atoms substituted on the copper sites. We can find them because they have a quasi-particle signature in single electron time. Every place where there's a zinc atom, there's a zero in the pair conductance. It's an excellent coverage. So this is an image of the Swiss cheese experiment in real space. What it shows is that we, what we are, unless mu SR is wrong, what it shows is that we're observing the amplitude of the condensate as a function <coughs> of location. Here, the resolution is about one nanometer in the first generation of the experiment. We can be sure we have one nanometer. What less. concentration zinc was that? Very, very low, very few low. per thousand. Yeah. Not, not enough to damage the superconductivity. We have asked now <laughs> to go beyond this so we can find out what does it really do to the cube. That would be very interesting. Yeah. So, so she wants to ask a question. So, yeah. But do I still find, like, are you saying that the atom have a very amplitude varying on length scales shorter than the superconducting coherence length? So, the, in my opinion, the superconducting coherence length in this compound is seven angstroms. And under those oh, circumstances, okay. the answer to your excellent question is no. It's really, you're saying it's well, really that the, the when we look inside the core, 
we can ask where does the coherence signal completely disappear in the signal particle spectrum? The radius is only seven extras. But usually, if we use something like HC2, that would be somewhat That would be 1,300 Tesla to 1,000 times. Oh, but sort of what the intercalation and so on. But I guess I used to was four letters, but not seven extras. Okay, well, what we observe is seven extras. And the hole in the vortex core is not much different than the object we see here. Okay. All right, now let us imagine that what yeah. I'm showing you is a picture of the kind of in the discussion. Pardon? The kind of in the discussion. Okay. Area. So so let me let me I'll wind this up in a second. So imagine we're imaging the density of pairs. We have been, you know, one of the things we found is that there's a pair density rate, but I'm not going to discuss that today. There is a pair density rate in qubits. Um, so by using this technique, we can tell where what is the apical distance. So here's a real surface. We measure the modulation of the surface, assign it a phase. Okay. And from the phase and from the x ray refinement, we assign an apical displacement everywhere in that field. Similarly, for so this is for a single electron tunneling, this is for a superconducting tip. In both cases, we can establish, we believe, what is the apical distance throughout a field of view. It's actually by nothing. So on the other hand, we can measure the high voltage spectrum as a function of location. If I just show you along this line here, the energy between here and here is modulating every period of the supermodulation. And on the other hand, we can measure the Josephson current. Now they are separated in voltage by five orders of magnitude, but we can measure the maximum in the Josephson current through the supermodulation. And it's also modulating very clearly. Um, what that means is for a given field of view, we know the charge transfer energy at every location and the phase at every location. We can map the charge transfer energy as a function of phase and average that over the whole sample to get charge transfer energy as a function of what's happening to the unit cell due to the modulation. Similarly, we can measure the Josephson curve as a function of phase of the modulation. Map that over the whole field of view, and that tells us what's happening to the electron pair density throughout the modulation. So we can combine all those three things together. Apical distance in the one period of the modulation from here, charge transfer energy in one period of the modulation from here, uh, electron pair density in one period of the modulation from here. So when we do that, we can plot um, charge transfer energy as a function of apical distance. Look at that line there. Uh, consistent with decades of theory, the slope of that line is near one electron volt per angstrom, the way it should be from a hand waving argument. So what we're observing is that when you move the apical oxygen atom back, it diminishes the splitting between the 2p6 state and the empty d state. That's an empirical fact in the density of space. Now, forget the apical distance. That was motiv a motivational tool. But here, it's just a common variable. What we really want to know is what happens to the charge to the electron pair density as a function of the charge transfer energy. So we can just remove the common variable, which is the phase, and plot electron pair density versus charge transfer energy while the apical atom moves 0.3 angstroms in this column. This is the depth. It's averaged over large fields of view, so the statistical error is fairly small. Systematic error has to do a lot with assumptions that go into this project, so we can discuss those. But statistically, it works fine. Um, here is the cone of interest that came from the uh, Cochlear and Hall prediction on this side and from the Tremblay prediction. On that side, most cube rates we believe are inside this point. Okay, so here are the facts. There's a modulation in this compound. The Josephson critical current squared modulates at that period. The gap between the top of the lower band and the bottom of the upper band modulates. Um, 
if we use the Josephson current squared as an estimate of the pair density and the gap we see in the single particle spectrum as an estimate of the charge transfer energy, then they're related by these data. Those are facts. This is not a theory. These are just experimental facts. Can you say again how you normalize the pair density from the... Uh, so, so, in, oh, so in this case, um, So in this case, there's a mean value of the Josephson current. So we normalize the experimental data by the mean value. So we're just reporting departures of the density from the mean value of density labeled one. So there's a, about a 15% enhancement. There's about a 15% suppression from the mean value. Now, the way we normalize it in the theory is to the parameters relevant to the material reported by the theory. Um, if one is willing to stipulate to CDMFT model for the three band Emory model um, as a plausible way of predicting this graph, then there is good agreement between the theory and the experiment, which we take as evidence that charge transfer super exchange, it definitely is the mechanism of Cooper Perry in this country. And I should thank my colleagues again. This project was done during the pandemic. So most of these people did not meet each other during the project. They did it all by Zoom at different labs and different continents. I'm extremely grateful to them for their excellent work. Thank you. Uh, we've got time for a few questions because there are lots of them during the talk. Just I'll try to be pragmatic. Uh, how much does this charge transfer energy variation translate in terms of the percentage of change of J? Um, just in the words like that. It should go as one is the variation in epsilon cubed. So it's one over epsilon cubed, so it's a variation in one over epsilon cubed. So, yeah, it, it's quite large, quite large. It's like 45%. Maybe it's not a step back. I feel like nobody has really been able to determine a J that's, you know, the neutral step in measure value of. Based on um, multi orbital, uh, so start the right. artificial. Right. So, so, in the insulator, they can measure J very accurately. In the conductor, then it's a contentious issue whether or not in the superconductor, whether or not they can measure. Okay. However, however, the logical structure of this project doesn't require anyone to measure J. It is just a parameter of interest to other people. Yeah. <laughs> My understanding is that this modulation is along the diagonal, right? Correct. You can break the symmetry between OX and OY. Correct. But what happens once you switch on the intermediate cell oh. and the physicity and you break the symmetry between OX and OY? That's a brilliant Does question. Just, uh, so, uh, I, I would like to answer that question offline. Okay. That's a brilliant question. So, I mean, the, the parallel stru structural studies, one that one stood out to me was the Musco grown on an expanded AB lattice, and TC goes up yeah. to like 30 to 40 Kelvin. Yeah. And so, I guess in this picture, if we expand this way, C axis compresses, D goes down, is that consistent with this? Well, you'd have to examine what yeah, happens to all the other parameters yeah. that you have the target, yeah. right? In the real deal. Okay, so to come back to a question yeah, that yeah. Eugene asked me at the beginning, so you could say, um, you know, how would we ever know whether a three band Emory model solved in CDMFT is actually a useful approximation for the cuplets? But one way to know would be if it provided testable predictions for physical observables, which then could be tested at other dopings 
for other crystal symmetries and other geometries, like, you know, real traditional solid state physics. So after a campaign like that, either we would know three band cluster DNFT can't do the job, or if we're really lucky, we'd find out it is a useful tool for predicting how the two brains work. So that's what we hope is going to happen. If you don't want to answer the question experimentally, what did that work by Andrew Miller's team, where we showed that the limiticity in the three band alley model we saw in our cluster DNFT yeah. enhanced PC? Yeah, there's half a dozen papers about including BPP in the three band Hamiltonian and finding out what it does to work in symmetry inside the okay. And the prediction of those papers are now available for our experimental study. Okay, since we had a lot of questions and we're going to run out of time for the discussion, uh, me and Kofi uh, will break now and meet again soon. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Thank you.